West Coast. One of Scary Cast's favorite guests, the one and only Flat Earth Advocate, Mark Sargent. Good afternoon, Mark. How are you doing? I am doing well, and good afternoon, and thank you, thank you very much for having me. It is a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. I am just, I wanted to do this show with just you and me on it because everybody, whenever we have like a group of scary casters, our regular crew, they always seem to get bottled up with the idea of the flat earth. I mean, I think it's a good idea. I think it has some merit. So as I told you, when we were in the green room, and I'm gonna, I don't mind telling everybody, I woke up this morning with two burning questions that I wanted to ask you. And here is the first one. Are you ready, Mark? Yep. Okay. First of all, why would a flat earth believer right. have a problem with the notion of a spherical earth? Because the spherical earth, in our opinion, does not make sense. And since all flat earth believers start off as spherical believers, as we all do, I mean, we're, that's what we're raised with. We don't, at, we try to shoot down the flat earth. The t-shirt the literally reads, I became a flat earther because I tried to disprove it. For me, it was, I wanted, I looked, I love the globe icon. I think it's a wonderful thing. And I was, I was practically married to it. You know, I, I actually collected antique globes. Nobody was more enchanted with the whole idea of space and the globe than I was. And so when, but when I started looking at it again, in, from a flat earth perspective saying, okay, what if there is something wrong with, with the globe? that's when everything started to fall apart because I was leaning more and more on our space programs. I was leaning more and more on the scientists. And by the end of the nine months that it took me to, to, to come around to this, I was like, yeah, I can't prove it. I can't prove the globe anymore. There are way too more, there are way more plot holes in the globe model than the flat earth. There's my opening statement. All right. I've got a question for you. Yeah. And this, and in my opinion, this is extremely related to that question and the flat earth right i'm going to ask a rhetorical question and give my answer okay. my rhetorical question is why didn't we go to the moon now when i say that people look at me because I'm a PhD research scientist from North Carolina State University and they know that I am well grounded in the scientific method and inquiring about things in a logical, a pretty logical way. Mm -hmm. But my question is this, I know that you are familiar with the Van Allen radiation belt. Yes. Now, from my understanding, those little flimsy suits that the astronauts had in that space capsule, how on earth did the astronauts not get burnt up right. in the Van Allen radiation belt? That's just that's just a question, and I need I need an answer as to why they didn't get burnt up. Right, and there there is no there is no answer to that. The um, radiation, for for all intents and purposes, is stopped by only three things on the ground, and most people know what it is. There's lead, which you wear at the dentist's office, that heavy lead thing. Um, there's gold, which is twice as dense as lead, but nobody uses it because it's so incredibly expensive. And there's a whole bunch of water. You could use water, which they use at power plants to, to do that. Well, all those things, the whole point is that they are dense and they are very, very heavy, which if you know anything about aerodynamics and, and flight and space programs, that's the last thing you want to add to any aircraft or spacecraft is a lot of weight. And so they didn't. And deliberately, it's like, okay, so instead of putting lead shielding or gold shielding or water shielding, which is ridiculous, on the spacecraft, we used aluminum and plastic, which doesn't, which are very lightweight. You know, they've got some structure to them, but they don't stop radiation at all. So, I mean, I stop. Yeah. Plastic can barely contain a can of coffee. <laughs> right. 
Right. It, it, yeah, <laughs> plastic, plastic back at it. you. I just, ha- I'm sorry that jumped in my head, and I had to say it. It's okay. Plastic has its uses, but some um, uh, not in not to. It's not going to save you from anything, right? Cars are still made out of steel, you know, at their at their main frame. So yeah, how did the astronauts, notably the Americans, because they're the only ones that even attempted it, which is a whole nother thing, which is, you know, the Americans went multiple times through the van a- radiation belts. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Uh, nobody even got cancer. I think there's still five of them, maybe four right now that are still alive walking around today. Uh, the last mission was in 1972. And then no one else out of the all the other space agencies, you know, um, Japan, Europe, China, Russia, and India, no one else even tried. Didn't even attempt, including us, which just blows blows my freaking mind. So yeah, how'd that happen? Nobody nobody wants to explain. They they dodge that question as much as humanly possible. So yeah, right. right. I mean, and and there's another question. There's another requ- question that I would like to just refresh people about this is the conversation that I had with my father Mm -hmm. when uh, they made it to the moon, so to speak. Right. And uh, I was a pretty, I was a pretty precocious, however old I was, 10, 12, 14 years old, eight, I don't remember. And my dad was an aviation engineer in World War II Mm -hmm. and, and a plane mechanic. You know, he nobody went to college back then. They all went directly from high school to, um, you know, to um, the war. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dad, we all know. And back in those days, we all knew that the moon was a quarter of a million miles plus or minus away from Earth. We all were taught that. That's what we learned in school. And I and I was really interested in radio. I wanted to work at the local radio station when I became 14. They said they would let me work there, and of course they did, and it was wonderful. And I have my uh, general class ham operator's license. I love radio. And that underscored my question. Why was there no delay when Mission Control in Houston was talking to the astronauts on the moon. That was a quarter of a million miles away. Right. That should have been eight to 10 seconds delay. Now it well, just should have. It just should have. Yes, absolutely should have. And moreover, how did they have communications at all? Forget about the eight second delay. Eight second delay assumes you have the power to beam the transmissions that you want back and forth with, without any distortion whatsoever or, or cutouts the the transmitter and you you know you can look at the the apollo pictures all day long there's a wonderful beautiful vhf transmitter that is an unclassified vhf transmitter which is basically running off a car battery right that thing's got a range of maybe 50 miles on a good day right and that's morse code and yet this same transmitter is firing off 10 frames of color video a second and perfect two-way communication and they lined it up perfectly with with a blue ball off in the distance, you know, your your best rifle scope guys couldn't line that thing up. And it was flawless. Absolutely freaking flawless. To the, to the point, it's like, oh, yeah, let's do a conversation with President Nixon without, with by the way, to your point, without any delay whatsoever, because it would have made the conversation way too awkward. There is a wonderful quote from Mark Twain, He got, which he said, again, this is production 101, which is never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Having the president of the United States have to wait eight seconds between back and forth conversations is not good television. We've got to make this. We've got to make this smoother. And again, the the general public is not taught physics. They are not taught engineering, and they don't know. And they they go with the Hollywood rules. And that is Hollywood, as you know. You watch movies and television shows your whole life. They gloss over these plot points. Right. It's like, well, we're just moving on to the next thing The the audience will accept it. And that's what the, the government uh, and the space programs were hoping to do. It's like, oh, yeah, the, the people will accept the radio transmissions. They will accept the, the radiation problem. They will accept the fact that the spacesuit doesn't turn into a parade float and explode and everybody dies. Right. How, how does a soft spacesuit? That's one of my the videos I'm working on today. It's like every other object. Sorry, let me let me throw this out there really quick. I want to because this is one of my driving force home. Any trolls that are listening to this, 
I put this challenge out there for years, which is any other soft object in a in a in a vacuum chamber expands and then it explodes. A basketball, a football, a can of soda, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's a pressure thing, right? No one can say tell me it's like what magical thing in that spacesuit keeps it from expanding to where they can't move and then it explodes. They tip over and then they die. No one will touch it. Tell me what magical thing. And even if you can tell me it's a microprocessor thing or they lowered the pressure to a certain point, it's like, okay, in 2024, I, I may even give you the benefit of the doubt, but in 1969, it was all analog. How'd you do it? Sorry. And one more thing, one more thing along those lines, things that are glossed over trolls, which is, you do you know any scuba diver friends? Dr. John? Uh, yeah, I do have a few friends. I don't know. I haven't discussed much about it, but I do have some friends. You know, and I know I'm familiar with it a little okay, bit. The, the, whole pr the whole premise, which is, you know, you can put the tanks on your back, you go underwater, and all they care about, all these scuba divers care about is how much air they got left. They are checking that gauge constantly. It's this giant gauge on their wrist, or it's hanging right next to them, and they're looking at it. They're looking at it. They're looking at it. How many minutes? Oh, eight minutes air left? I got to get back up there. Do you know who didn't care about air? ever the astronauts they never talked about it they had apparently an unlimited air supply that never that never was a thing it's like that would be a big deal it's like before i'm sorry they took risks that no one would ever do it's like you put let's say again they they built a moon buggy right built it to took it off the side of the capsule built it even though they didn't show anybody building it right drove this thing out miles away from the craft right i'm sorry if that thing broke down you have to hoof it back to your, your craft. It's like you would never do that because you should have a limited amount of air. I never heard an astronaut say, oh, hey, hey you got like 12 minutes of air left. We should probably start heading back. Never talked about it. Sorry. Sorry. I'm passionate about this whole thing. Well, I mean, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. It, it, it really is. And I mean, th those, are, there, those are several good points. And our listeners will hear them and they can say what they wish. Uh, I, you got I'm just I'm just here to get you know some good solid opinions as to what's going on. Yeah. All right, I think we've covered that question enough that that will give people something to think about. Okay. Now here comes the next question. Yes. Why would a spherical Earth believer have a problem with the flat Earth model? Why would they have a problem with it? the spherical earth believer or the round earthers, depending on how you want to, I mean, some people go with round and it's fine. Um, but the spherical earth or the globe earth believer has a problem with the flat earth because it undermines the entire foundation of science. Everything in science, no matter what field you're in, you know, hydrology, biology, geology, archaeology, whatever it is, Everything comes back to the main premise that you're living on a globe. If the world is not a globe, if you're living in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling, then it was built by somebody. And not only that, every other aspect of the, of the, of the globe just gets you know, wiped out and you have to start rebuilding your models from the ground up. No play on words there. That offends scientists just offends that scientists as in fact i made a I, i've done two videos short videos very recently they're only 60 seconds long on scientism how science is is the most closed-minded group there is they don't believe in anything they, they believe they'll they'll believe in stuff and they'll take the money and and do make all sorts of horrible decisions but they won't even believe in in simple things like animals that we see it drives me insane um you know i i talked about you know briefly about like the giant panda was a myth and the the giant anaconda and the giant squid all myths and, and what got me what got me the most was and you know you know what a platypus is or at least you've heard the name right mm -hmm. the platypus right talk to any scientist about the platypus and they just they'll they'll start looking at their shoes and and start trying to think of other things to talk about because the platypus they even when they had a live one staring at them in a lab right? Looking up at them with their beady little eyes, right? Moving around. They thought it was fake because it destroyed their model of evolution. It absolutely tore it to shreds. And which is why um, we've been coming up with a slogan for it. Uh, we're we're going to call it the Flatipus, I think. 
and uh, and, and the slogan is impossible but true. And that's what scientists were saying. Like, look, this thing can't exist, and yet there it is. And they had such a hard time with it. The flat Earth, the same thing, which is if the the flat Earth is impossible, but it's true, and they have a really really tough time with it, and they have to reevaluate everything they you know they studied over the years. And the the more education, the the worse it is. Uh, which is why I say, look, if you have a master's degree or higher in a physical science, God help you if you're a PhD, unless you're as open minded as you, Doctor John, then, <laughs> then, then you're going to have look, look, problems. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, no, I mean, yeah, come on, in your peer groups, in your circles, you have, I'm sure you know a, a, a number of masters and PhD people which are rock solid about a lot of things. And the, the, the whole five le levels of acceptance really apply to them. They don't want to deal. Flat Earth, they just laugh it off. It's like, there is no way in a million years. It's, and that's, in fact, I tell them, I go, well, you better come up with an argument that's easier than ours to explain. And it's like, we don't have to. That's beneath us. Like, oh, fine. You were warned. Anyway, there you go. So that short, short version to your question, it offends them. Flat Earth offends them to their very core. And they get angry. I have watched that, you know, the first two stages of acceptance. First one is denial, followed very, very quickly by anger. And that's what they, they, in fact, a lot of them can't p get past the anger. They, they don't even move on to bargaining and depression and all that. Very, it's, it's very, very tough for them to do because it's their life's work. So there you go. It, it, it is. I, I'm sorry. I was, I, I was, I was all of a sudden trying to find some documents that I have about skeptics. Ah, because I think, I think skeptics are pretty much mentally ill. Well, I am putting together. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you why. Now, I, I just okay. made a big bad statement. If you if you want to be a skeptic, you need to prove what you're saying. And all they want to do is say, "Well, it could." You know what? Right now, I am finishing the book, Georgia UFO Sightings. Right. Thirty major sightings in the state of Georgia. People love this stuff. Yeah. And I've been promising that people didn't know I've been I've been hunkering down at night working on all this stuff. So anyway, we're getting pretty close. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully within about a week, it'll be up on Amazon. And I'll send everybody an email, say, buy it. It's going to be a good book. Yeah. And what I don't understand. I don't think there are enough weather balloons. To have caused all of these UFO sightings, oh, I don't, I don't think there are. And I mean, I love the idea of weather balloons. They're they're preposterous. I mean, they they're real, but they don't explain everything. Right. They oh. just don't. Oh, you you're, you're you're old enough to know the the cliche jokes. You know, they're almost memes now. In fact, I'm sure they are memes. Where you know the when the government tried to look into it decades ago with the, you know, they, they kept using the same things, weather balloon, you know, it's a weather balloon, uh, a Venus, the, the uh, Venus is bouncing off a weather balloon through some swamp gas. You know, the fact that they even use swamp gas is one of their, their, their go-tos. And, and it's like, Oh no, no, no. It mo 90% of them are, are, uh, are absolutely misidentified and the remaining 10%. Well, it's like, well, you know, we, we're not even really going to talk about those. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's so it's so funny you mentioned swamp gas. Yeah. I have lived in Myrtle Beach for 25 years. Yeah. Coming on 25 years. Yeah. We live in a county that is full of swamps. Sure. Full of swamps. Everywhere you go, there's a bridge that says, you know, Boggy Creek Swamp, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I have never seen swamp gas. I truly have never. Right. And I've been driving the roads around here, all these little two-lane roads. I sold life insurance 12 years. I have never seen swamp gas. Yeah. Now, 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 come on. You know, I mean, I'm 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 all the time looking at things. Every time I hear a noise in my condo, I look around to see what what could have caused that noise. And a lot of times I see nothing. Right. And I know that something or someone is visiting. Sure. Now I, I just know that for a fact. The more you listen and the more you watch for things, for anomalies, the more you will see them, Mark Sargent. Don't you agree? 
Yes. Oh yeah. And yeah. and it's like you know, I am from Burke County, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. What people don't want to give it credit for is that's where the Brown Mountains are and the Brown Mountain Lights. Um, everybody wants to say it's swamp gas. Right. Now you know we're talking. We're four thousand feet up from uh, from sea level. Sure. There is no swamp gas <sighs> in the Brown Mountains. Now there just is not. Right. It's just like it's just like you can't get through the Van Allen radiation belt with a little bit of aluminum right. protecting you. And there is no swamp gas in the Brown Mountains. Right. But that's what they want. They want to uh, to go forth and conquer and tell. Yeah. And it's so funny. I had Matt Delph on last night because we're doing a big series on UFOs. I love UFOs. We've got the World UFO Conference coming up November second. Sure. At, Piedmont, at Piedmont University in Demarest, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And then we have the Atlanta UFO Conference on uh, February the 1st at the Gainesville Civic Center, starring Dr. Brooks Agnew and starring Michael Barra from Ancient Aliens. I mean, we've nice. got great people coming in. And, I, and I'll just be honest with you, i got to get you over here. Before life is over, i got to get Mark Sargent over here because I find you entertaining. Well, thank you. Thank and you. not and inter, I find you entertaining. I, I find you fairly intellectual about what you say. It's right. very, you, have, you have very simple arguments, and I like that. It's just so. In, anyway, you know, we got all this going on, and I had Matt Delph on last night, mm-hmm. and he talked about a Mister Lael who had interactions with space aliens, mm-hmm. and they let him see some things in a cave on the brown in the brown mountains mm-hmm. that they shouldn't have but they did and he kept his mouth shut he kept his word well let me tell you about mr lale mm-hmm. mr lale's mother was my grandmother's best friend in glen alpin north carolina mm. and everybody knew him to be kind of crazy because he had lots of weird stories. Sure. And I didn't know what the stories were. My parents, we didn't know. They just were crazy stories, you know, whatever. And Ms. Layla was all, all the time trying to uh, cover up for him and make him seem like he wasn't crazy. Mm-hmm. He might not have been crazy. His stories are too well put together for a, a guy that owns a furni- that owned a furniture store in Hickory, North Carolina. Right. So, I mean, you know, the, the fact is, People want to deny lots of stories. Boy, you can't get a scientist to come near Kelly, Kentucky. And the Kelly Little Green Men, you can't get a scientist to come within a thousand miles of that. Sure. Because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to lose their NSF grants. That's all they care about is NSF grants because the National Science Foundation controls what we research because they give out money to do this research. It's it's true. When when scientists, when people reach a certain intellectual level, you don't understand, I mean, you do from, from your education, which is it's all about being published. It's all about peer groups. And it's all about the money, the grants, which was nobody wants to upset any of those apple carts. You definitely, I mean, one of the scariest words I've ever found in the intellectual world is ostracized which is you you make it up to a certain level you got your peer group you got your your friends like hey i'm gonna be hanging out with these nerds for the rest of my life basically and then all of a sudden you decide to have a, a weekend of open-mindedness and say something <laughs> t- tell a story that you shouldn't be telling and again uh, the 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 person you were talking about where um no i don't think he was crazy at all you know he was just open-minded enough to explore the possibilities Whereas science just shuts it down. They just drop the steel door and it's like, nope, we're not talking about it. We're closed. And uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. But then again, you know, I've met some amazing people in the last 10 years of doing this, which, uh, you know, and I wouldn't trade them in for anything. I wouldn't trade them in for all the PhDs in the world. No offense to you, of course. Well, I know. I know. And when I was getting my doctorate at North Carolina State, I was a research associate at the Ryan Institute of Parapsychology in uh-huh. Durham. Now, you mm-hmm. talk about something that scares the scientific community. Sure. They're terrified 
of those results. I bet. And I have seen things happen there that you can't explain. And they're, they're some of the nicest people fighting an uphill battle with no grants. I don't even know. I think they just barely make their rent every month. But they're, still, the pas they're still passionate enough to push forward, though, which I respect. They are. And, and I found my little niche. I put on conferences. Nice. And so I can go around and talk about UFOs and Bigfoot all I want, and nobody right. complains. Because that's <laughs> kind of what I do for a living. But it's fun. Sure. And I and I think people need they need to have an open mind. They're not going to. I mean, I hate to tell you this, but it's like uh no, I better not say that. no there, there's a statement I was going to say, Mark. Well, no, no, I can I I and that I, might that one might get me in too much trouble with my my contemporaries look, here in but you know, so I'm you know that's all right let me jump in without you having to say it jump in Sci scientists i'm going to generalize scientists because of their conditioning because of their education because of their background and the reinforcement over and over and over you're right uh, and i i have said this especially over the last few years i'm not worried about trying to in fact i i'm pretty much i've never seen a scientist change their mind uh from a hard line no to you know to to being you know thumbs up with us uh i'm not worried i'm not worried about them for the most part for for uh, for me it's the audience that's listening it's you know so when i when i get on with a host and i know they've got a subject matter expert they've got a scientist they got an astronaut whoever it is that it's like i am not going to convince the astronaut i don't care about that astronaut i don't care about the host i don't care about a lot of them all i care about is the audience because the audience is way more flexible way more pliable and it's like yeah i yeah of course that being the you know the audience most of them are going to go with the host or most of them are going to go with the subject matter but there's going to be some that aren't and i get the emails every time after that and it's like hey tell me more hey tell me more and they'll go out and do their which is why we always say do your own research take what i say with a grain of salt eventually it's going to come down to you i'm not here to convince you or persuade you i'm here to put the idea in your head you're the one that's got to figure it out for yourself which is why we have such a high retention rate Anyway, sorry, I ramble. No, no, that that's great. I think that is uh, a very well put statement. Thanks. So we do have a problem, mm -hmm. and the problem is, and I, th I guess I can say this with the National Science Foundation. There you go. Uh, it really is, and I'm trying to think. The Edgar Casey Institute yeah. had to fund. A journey of scientists over to explore the Sphinx. Sure. Now, why did Edgar Casey Institute, that doesn't have millions upon millions upon millions of dollars, like the NSF and all these things, why did they have to fund this thing? They didn't have the money. I mean, they have a little bit of money, but not not the kind of money to send eight scientists over to drill holes into the Sphinx, mm -hmm. and then have the Egyptian army come out and say, you can't be doing this. Oh, yes, we can. No, you can't leave. You know, yeah. and, and that's what they, they went through. So, I mean, you know, the people that are doing the research, um, Nikolai Tesla wasn't funded. After J.P. Morgan pulled his, um, pulled his support for free electricity, free energy, right. Tesla didn't have anybody to support him, and he kept doing it till the early 40s when he passed away. So, I mean, you know, you do it because you're, because you love what you do and you're curious. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that in a hundred years, we will be looked upon as scientists because that's the way it always is. When you have an opinion that people don't like right. in the mainstream, it takes sometimes 50, 100 years to get your voice heard. Right. But then once you do, it just becomes, oh, yeah, we've known about that for a long time. And then they take ownership of the result that was really yours or those that were a little bit on the fringe. Right. So it's like, and God, don't even talk to me about radionics. They will not study radionics or life, limb, pursuit of the happiness or anything. They won't study radionics. And I just right. think, Radionics is great. Uh, so anyway, that's just kind of 
And I think it's been good for us to discuss these opinions, don't you? I do. I do. Um, you know, one of my, I, I really take shots at science on a regular basis to the point where, you know, I call it scientism now because they really created their own pseudo religion. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, probably the most famous media scientist in the world. There's only three of them, by the way, out there that they ever put on camera. Neil Tyson from America, uh, Brian Cox from the UK and Michio Kaku from Japan. And he made this statement, which just annoyed me to no end. He said, science is right whether or not you believe in it. And it's like, okay. You know, the, and what he was saying was that when we put our stamp on something, it's considered a law. But what bugs me more than anything is when they get it wrong, it's only the science is only right until the day it's not. And they don't issue apologies. They just change the definition. They change, they move the goalposts to where, I don't know, I'm mixing metaphors here, to where it's under the umbrella of science. You know, li little things like um, neuroscience and free will, you know, an experiment they discovered years ago where the, you know, the computers can see when a, a, when a human brain makes a decision eight seconds before the question's even asked which screams predestination or one of my favorites would be like the double slit experiment which is akin to uh you know the old question we got when we were in school which was if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it does it actually make a sound right well we didn't know back in the 70s we know now it's like no it doesn't make a sound because there is no tree because only the observer can see the tree there is you know the, the reality is built be around us and um, the, the double slit experiment screams that. It's stuff we do in simulations and um, computers all day long. And yet science says, well, the double slit experiment is, we can't explain it, but it's repeatable. Therefore, it's under science. It's like, how, how does that work? You have basically just said, oh, yeah, it's a mystery. But because we can do it every time, uh, it's, it's, it's now considered science. And yeah, I get the, the saying, which is, um, science is just mystery or uh, magic without the mystery. You know, it's like you do it over and over, you know, things, you know, full well. I mean, if you took some of our inventions and took them back just even a couple hundred years, you'd be burned at the stake, right? You know, the witch, it'd make the witch trials look like nothing. Right. And, and yet we use this stuff all the time. We just take it for granted. You know, we grew up with it. I know I'm kind of all over the place with this, but yeah, science bugs me when when it does that they never apologize for when they get it wrong absolutely freaking wrong and they just say well it's just a new definition of science that's just how it works and it's like really you're going to do that to flat earth too one day you're going to say well we kind of knew but we couldn't say it it's like really we really couldn't say it because if we published a paper we would be ridiculed but we knew there were problems yeah. that's pretty much what will be said yeah. Now, yeah, they can do whatever they want to do. I don't care. Look, look up. If you go into Google, anybody that's listening to this, go into Google and type in ancient cosmologies and then click on images, right? Every culture going back forever, our entire unbroken history, it only goes back, what, 5,000 years. And I know there's other cultures that are older than that, but unbroken history. And, um, and then look what they drew. They all drew the same thing. They drew a freaking snow globe. And you could say, oh, no, the Greeks. It's like, oh, screw the Greeks. The Greeks were making massive assumptions. There was always going to be somebody that was going to go out on a limb. But they didn't know what the world looked like because all the continents weren't discovered. So they were they were, they were just taking a stab at it. But everyone, What do you mean all the continents? What do you mean all the continents? Well, okay, were all, the continents all the continents that, were, that are on the map currently. How's that? Okay, yeah. uh, because I, I am now fishing for the answer of Perry Reese. That map, which has all of the all of the intricacies of Antarctica, and right. you know, so what I'm saying is, and yet scientists want to say we we go back what eleven thousand years and that's it, when they have artifacts that are much older than that. Yeah, and yeah. and we and and then I love the phrase impossible engineering. I have taught this phrase to a number of people. Here's an example of impossible engineering. Let's build the Erie Canal. Okay? Okay. Build the Erie Canal. 363 miles from Albany to uh, Buffalo. Sure. Okay, I asked my friend Josiah, who lives in Buffalo, and his dad was in construction. I said, Josiah, suppose I had a 10-year project 
and it would take me 10 years to do it down here in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. Could I do it in 10 years up there in Buffalo? He said, oh, my goodness, no, because you can't work but half a year, sometimes less, right. because the ground is frozen. There's snow. If you want to do construction, you got to, you're not going to be able to do that, John. I didn't tell him why I was asking. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, they couldn't have built the, uh, the Erie Canal in 19 years. They couldn't have done it. Right. Because they didn't have enough time. They had like eight and a half years. I mean, nine and a half years. Right. So, I mean, you know, it just doesn't work. It's called impossible engineering. Another e evidence of impossible engineering is, of course, the Pyramid of Giza. Oh. We could not build that today if we had to. No. No, we couldn't. And in fact, to your point, when I heard that, that was one of my uh, little bucket list things. And I went, uh, oh, good Lord, 12, 12 years ago, at least, where, you know, I went to the, I stood right there, the, the Pyramid of Giza, because people said, you really want to get a perspective, go there and look at it, and then turn around and look at the city. And I understood what they meant. And I'm not trying to pick on the Egyptian people. But when I got there and I looked at the pyramids, which are incredibly impressive, and you got to remember the uh, the marble siding has all been stripped off of them. You know, the capstones, which still nobody knows where they went, right? The the wonderful capstones and the white marble siding, which was on until I think the early 1800s, and then they stripped it off for parts because the the marble was was expensive. Um, that was that was there. But when I when you look at Cairo, you realize because Cairo is just a it's a mess. Right. There, there are so many streets on there that aren't even paved that they don't even let tourists go down. And you look and it's like, oh, yeah, these guys had nothing to do. I mean, Cairo backs up. You you look at the pictures and it's, it looks like the pyramids are in the middle of the desert. That is not true. There is a Starbucks 100 yards away from the uh, from the pyramids. If you turn around, they made it to where you don't build in front of the scenic part of the pyramids. So it can be the ultimate tourist thing. But right behind it is, you know, just a nonstop thing of tour buses. And I knew, and, and they say, oh yeah, the, the, the pyramids were built in 30 years. It's like, really? You know, to your point, we couldn't build them now. You, really, you built these things in 30 years? Because there isn't a single hieroglyph about how they were built. Not a single one. And I understood, which is, it's something that mankind has been notorious for, which is taking credit for things that aren't there. Imagine you're one of the Pharaoh's recon people, right? Back in the day, before Cairo was built. And you're going through the desert and you find the pyramids. And then you realize, there's nobody around here. You just hear wind, right? It's just sand and nothing. It's like, you know what? We built them. And I and all you have to do is wi and within one generation, that's it. The pharaohs built the pyramids and you then they are elevated to demigod status. And the and the whole city and civilization and the myths and legends are built around that claim. That's like, oh yeah, the pharaohs built the pyramids. They were buried inside them. And even though it's like, yeah, well, how'd you build them? It doesn't really matter. We're, again, Hollywood plot point. We're just moving past that. It doesn't matter how we built them. We just built them to where it was a mystery for the ages. And every scholar for years and centuries said the same thing. It's like, how'd you build it? And they came up with all these theories of it, you know, the rolling logs and thousands of men. And it's like, really? Because you'd have to put these, those massive blocks in there. What? One every two minutes? You know, something, it was like ridiculous, the amount of, of, uh, of stone that was used for each of them, for all three. It was just, it was just freaking amazing. So yes, yes. To your point, impossible engineering. Absolutely. I love that phrase. And we see it, you know, it's funny. We see it every day, but we ignore it. We are conditioned to ignore things that we don't understand. And you know that. Yeah. Yeah, you accept we, we accept it. It's like, yeah, it, okay, fine. It exists. You know, it's there. So somebody had to have built it. I it's too tough for me to think about. Therefore, I'm just going to go on with my daily life and where's my Krispy Kreme donut? You know. It, they 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 gloss over it and they they don't explore it. The scientists though, they keep scratching their heads and and you know, they keep publishing papers. Just, oh, well, we think it's this, we think it's that. It's like, no, nope, that doesn't work. That doesn't work either. But you keep trying. That's what the skeptics do with um, weather balloons. They right. want to say everything's a weather balloon, and that's fine. Oh yeah, that's ab that's absolutely not true. Um, let me get through this in there really quick. You know, because I was a UF guy for UFO guy for years when I was out in Colorado. I lived in there for twenty years in the beautiful high altitude sky, and there was this British uh, program, little conspiracy thing. And at the very end, he goes, "You want to see some weird stuff?" He goes, "Get some night vision, go outside, start looking at the sky for a while." 
And that's exactly what I did. I, I hunted for different versions of night vision binoculars, not monoculars, binoculars like five power or higher gen ones, because you don't need gen two or gen three, don't spend the money. And I laid up there and, you know, and I'm on my back in the snow, right in Colorado, what, you know, watching the sky. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, there's a lot more satellites than, than I thought, right? In, you know, or weather balloons or whatever. And I was going, I was getting pretty bored. It's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, the sky is crawling with satellites, apparently, way, you know, 10, 15 times more than I thought, which you can't see with the naked eye. And then all of a sudden I was watching one because they're about the same size as stars, right? I think deliberately, I think it's a Steven Spielberg joke, inside joke we'll talk about later, which is all of a sudden I saw one go, come across me and it slows down and it stops, right? I'm going, well, what are you doing, right? And then it was like it was lost. And then all of a sudden it makes a hard left turn and at ballistic speed goes up even, even higher and, and goes out of sight. I'm going, what the heck did I just see? And then I didn't trust anything. So I started watching them more and more. I'm going, these aren't satellites. These aren't weather balloons. I don't know who they are, but they ain't us. And they, and again, it was so easy to tell between, because DIA, Denver International Airport, was 40 miles directly to the east of me. So I knew the inbound routes. I know the outbound routes. These things were at least twice as high as any civilian aircraft. And I watched, I stayed on the ground and watched these things for years at night. It was absolutely amazing. I was hooked, absolutely hooked with the night vision stuff. And uh, the only reason I stopped is because I moved uh, back to the Northwest where, you know, too much cloud cover. But it was absolutely amazing. Highly encourage anybody. Get some night vision binoculars. You can find the cheap ones uh, on Amazon now, the next gen stuff. And uh, high, it, they're all real. Absolutely real. Right. We have a fellow named Les Durant. He's been on my show several times. Yeah. And he shows people how to view those objects that seem to be flying around all over. Yeah. And he's going to be at both the um, World UFO Conference on November 2nd. And he's also going to be on at uh, the Atlanta UFO conference on February 1st. So, you know, we, we, we got that part covered because I believe like you do, there's lots of stuff up there and we just, they don't bother to tell us. So we don't bother to do it. Then you find someone that does and he trains a lot of people on how to look at these things. So it's, it's very interesting. And the Americans like to take credit for it. The, again, the American military, give them, I, I will give them credit which is they, with a wink and a smile, they kind of say, you know, kind of hint. It's like, wow, it could be us reverse engineering stuff. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't explain pretty much, you know, that's the recent stuff. You know, you know full well. I mean, you're you're well-versed in this. It's like, the, for me, the, the greatest UFO sighting wasn't, um, wasn't Roswell. It wasn't even 1891 or 1899 Aurora, Texas. It was uh, 1561 Nuremberg, you know, the, the, the great Nuremberg event over, over Germany you know, giant, giant space aircraft carriers hammering each other in a cloudless April sky for an hour, you know, to where, the, and again, there were no photographs, obviously, because it was pre-photography, but they, they, the sketch artist drew the whole thing in glorious color and it's still in their museums and it's, it's gorgeous. Look at the wiki page on it. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And well, yeah, so, so that's for the U.S. military. It's like U.S. military. Yeah, yeah. That ha that was that was hundreds of years before we were a country. So don't try to think you're going to take credit for that one. You know, I, I'm I'm sorry. I thought you might state my favorite sighting of all time, and you'll be surprised. What is it? Pascagoula. Ooh. Terrifying. Those two guys. They both said independently they have never been so frightened in their lives. Sure. Pascagoula. And I mean, you know, nobody does anything about it. It's not celebrated. Right. If I didn't live so far from Mississippi, I would I would go run, run a conference over there because it's just, it's a landmark in ufology. Yes. Kind of like Betty and Barney Hill. Why doesn't New Hampshire have a Betty and Barney Hill festival? There oh, my go. God, that's, that's a good idea. Hey, Mark. You want, to, you want to come help me do a Betty and Barney Hill festival? <laughs> That'd be kind of fun. <laughs> you know, it. and I know here we're not supposed to talk about things like this, but you know, it would be fun because they're, they have a granddaughter that's still alive. There you go. And I mean, it would just be so much fun because I, I know it wasn't any fun for them. No, of course not. <laughs> but I mean, for us, it would, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like the joy you get going to the Mothman Festival. 
There you go. Yeah. And what's great about the Mothman Festival is not what it celebrates. It's the fact that Point Pleasant, West Virginia was flat out broke and was really about to close. Yeah. The city offices were getting ready to close. And there's a gentleman, I don't remember his name, but he was a vocational education teacher at the local high school. Mm -hmm. And in three weeks, he decided to put together tours of the dynamite plant. Had 3,000 people come. And then year before last, it was named the largest economic driver between Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Charleston, West Virginia. And it hmm. saved, economically speaking, that entire part of West Virginia. Nice. That's what the Mothman has done for us. People, so, love, people love a mystery, as you know, and some mysteries are better than others. You know, uh, I, I don't want to necessarily pick on ghost hunters too much. But God, how many years did that show run? And you know the right the, the joke was you know the, every episode it's like wait shh, did you hear something? I mean that's that's basically the show. It's like really ten seasons you get away with that for for ten freaking seasons. And people human beings love a mystery. Uh, we're we're drawn to them. UFOs and and everything around that is is so compelling. Uh, because, but and and on a uh, even a higher level, because it gets you closer to the the core questions that we ask every day. It's like, why are we here, and are we alone? You know, has anyone else gone through this? You know, everybody wants to to look at the upperclassmen because I kind of treat it like a high school, and because uh, we're not we're not the first people to rent this apartment by any stretch in this in this world. I mean, you know full well the the civilizations that have been lost. You know, the sunken cities off Japan, the sunken cities off of India. Um, Puma Punku, Machu Picchu. How about the sunken city 50 miles off New Orleans? Oh, I don't know about that one. I'm working on it. Oh, neat. That sounds like fun. Oh, it, it is. And I'm having a hard time reaching everybody, but I don't care. You know what? I hate to admit this to everybody, but I am really an idiot. If I want to do something, I will lower my head. And I will keep pushing forward until I find the answer. Now, I just will. And I don't know that it's necessarily any kind of smarts. It's just being pigheaded. And I think sometimes that's what good research is. Yeah. I I mean, some people call it stubborn. I call it persistence. And persistence, I mean, it's why I call it persistence pays off. You know, if you keep, you're going to get to your answer one way or the other as long as you keep pushing. So don't don't ever come down on yourself for that. Oh, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, kind of comically speaking, I just put my head down and I just keep going. When I believe something is out there, I have another area of the Southeast that I happen to know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell where it is because mm -hmm. we're about two years away from a major conference up there. Right. But I know where something is and I'm just not going to stop. Because it's fun. You know, I guess that's the deal. I, I mean, I, I have this little business. Make, makes me a living. It pays my expenses. But I love what I do. And do you know what I woke up today? Mm. I woke up today with your two questions on my head and saying, oh, my gosh, I, I get to talk to Mark Sargent today. <laughs> so I had, the, I had the best morning of anybody in America. Aww. Because I got to talk. No, because I got to talk to you about the things that I love. Yeah. And, and how lucky can I, I mean, honestly, how lucky can I get? And I hope everybody, I don't care what you find that you really love and think is great, find it yeah, and explore it because that's, that's what life's about, isn't it, sir? It is. The, you know the saying uh, probably better than most, which was, uh, it, it, it's cheesy, but I love it, which is find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And it's so true, which is um, I, I try to tell people is like, look, um, happiness is not something uh, that should be chased. It should be something that uh, is discovered. And once you find it, hold on to it. Don't don't let anyone. You know, the the peer peer pressure is such a tough social motivator because it it keeps people back. You know, drags people back into the flock. And, uh, you know, and, and they end up doing stuff they don't want to do. They just keep, you know, doing the grind and, and not 
and then all of a sudden they you know they get regret at the end it's like oh man you i mean how many times you heard this from people it's like oh i should have i should have been doing this so much sooner should have been doing this so much earlier and so it's like why didn't you it's like well i was afraid of what friends and family and coworkers would think and it's like yeah throw it out peer pressure only goes so far i mean i know the ash experiment is real and i know the milgram experiment is real uh, but you have a chance to break out of that. And and if it makes you happy, do it. You know, as long as it's constructive and it's not hurting anybody, then, hey, it's not hurting anybody. Now, now, by the way, you just mentioned two things, those two experiments. And I know yeah. that 99% of our listeners do not know what you're talking about. Please carefully oh, yeah. state those names so that people can do like I do. They're going to go to Wikipedia. Or somewhere right. and look it up because you know it's important when you find these little nuggets of information that you explore them. Please tell okay. us, Mark. Uh, sorry, um, the Milgram experiment is the famous uh, electroshock experiment, which uh, which researchers figured out that people. The short version is is that people will defer to anyone in a position of authority or a lab coat and chance to do awful things. So what they did was you went into a room. And they they introduce you to somebody. It's like, oh, this person's going to go into another room, which you're not going to see, and you're going to ask them questions. And if they get these questions wrong, you're going to hit this button, and it's going to shock them. And you're going to be able to hear them this entire time, right? And every time they get that wrong, you're going to up the voltage a little bit, right? And what they found was, as long as they didn't see the person directly, right? And of course, the the, the screams and everything from the other room were pre-recorded. It wasn't real. You weren't shocking anyone, right? But you didn't know that. Um, but eventually, what, what happened is these people get kind of uncomfortable. It's like, I don't think I'm doing this guy any favors. And he would look to the guy with the lab coat and the clipboard. And the lab coat and the clipboard is like, you must continue the experiment. You're required to continue. There's no law. He's not. It doesn't happen with a gun to his head, right? And what they found was initially the, the, the scientists thought, well, less than 2% of the people are going to shock these guys to death, right? And it turns out that as long as you're off, you think you're off the hook, right? And, you know, they, you know, that's like the, the scientist is going to take the responsibility. There was a 60% chance that you were going to shock this guy into the grave. Then you combine that with the ash experiment, which is the ash experiment is just straight up peer pressure. And you know this one, which is you, you go into a room with like five people, right? All these five people are actors. You're the only one that that's not. And then, then the guy up on the board, it's like, tell me, all you guys, raise your hand. What is the shortest line on the board, right? And, you know, the, the first couple are easy. And then you get to the third one. It's, it's absolutely wrong. You know that that is not the shortest line on the board, right? And the five people are like, no, no, raising their hands. Because you want to fit in, because you don't want to stand out from the peer group, you go along with it, right? And then same thing, you know, Candid Camera used to do it back in the day with elevators. Very, very funny. Oh, was, Candid Camera was just, they, they were, had to take that, that had, they had to take that off television. It was too cool. It was, it was so fun where you had be in an elevator and the people, you get on the elevator and five other people usually would be standing facing the wrong way, like to the side where, where it wasn't even a door, right? They're facing that way. And almost invariably, you know, if the elevator ride was long enough, that person coming in would turn that way because they wanted to fit in with the group. The point was when you merge those two experiments, right, the Milgram experiment and the Ash experiment, to where you were sitting there controlling some voltage, you know, with a guy, and there was two other people down from you doing the same thing, that 60% chance of you just keeping upping the voltage until you maxed it out went up to 90%. So don't tell me what people aren't capable of. People with the, the power of persuasion and the power of just fitting. That's why they call it... Um, uh, mob rules, by the way, which is why mobs are really dangerous. Once that groundswell starts going, right, mobs, you know, are capable of doing all, you know, burn that building. Oh, yeah, let's do that. You know, because they 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 feel not only do they want to go along with the group, but they feel like they're, you know, they're part of something. So anyway, yeah. So it's it's a powerful motivator. But at the same time, you, you have a chance. You have the choice to to break out of it. It's just a question of are you open minded enough to do it, and are you does kind of like with you? It, do you feel a passion for it? Does it make you happy to do something that the rest of the people aren't a part of? If it does, then ignore them. Just I yes, you're going to catch some some hell for it. 
but you will be more satisfied in the end uh, if you stick with it, you know, in the end and be like, yeah, I stood my ground. That should be one of my T-shirts, by the way. Stand your ground. That, that That's true. Well, Mark, this has truly been a pleasure speaking with you. I have enjoyed it so much. Thanks. And I believe that our listeners will, too. Um, you're right. Just do what you like. Yeah. If you're lucky like me, um, you can get lucky. Yeah. But, yeah I, it, but I wake up every morning, and I'm very happy with what I do. And I go to bed at 2 in the morning. I mean, just because I do. I mean, because yeah. I'm I'm working that late. I've got a project I'm working on, trying to finish up Georgia UFO sightings. The yeah. book, I've got to finish it up, get it to my editor this weekend, get the thing out on Amazon and tell everybody about it so I can get, share the excitement. Because nobody's ever done this. But I, I can't believe that nobody took the top 30 UFO sightings in Georgia and wrote a book about them. I mean, that's just nuts. Hmm. But I did. Well, I'll have to check it out. Well, yeah, I'll we'll we'll, we'll talk. I'll, I'll give you a call when all that's over, like next week, and we'll do it. But Mark, okay. thank you very much. It's always been a pleasure. Will you come back? Absolutely, I'll come back. Just let me know. Okay, well, I will. And and look, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. This is Doctor John Stamey. I want to tell you two things. Number one, November the second is the date for the fall 2024 World UFO Conference, Piedmont University, Demarest, Georgia. Beautiful location, the nicest people. They are wonderful to work with. They're kind of like my buddies up at the Rabin County Chamber of Commerce. They are wonderful to work with too. I meet some of the, you know, I meet, because of this paranormal world, I meet some of the absolute nicest people in the world, like Linda Scarborough, and Mickey uh, Duval over up in Rabin County, and the folks down there at Piedmont Tech, and uh, the pe the people at the Gainesville Civic Center. Everybody's really nice. And you know what's funny? You talk. You want to talk about paranormal events, and most of the time they listen, and I really appreciate it. And of course, we had one of our favorite guests, Mark Sargent. We'll have him back again. So, folks, thank you so much for being with us. We will see you really soon. We're trying to up our number of podcasts every week on um, on ScaryCast because there are a lot of great guests out there. We we had we just had Dave Sheely on a little bit ago. We're going to have him for a part two. Then we're going to combine the two. Dave Sheely being, of course, the head of the Skunk Ape Museum in Florida. He's Dave is a fantastic person. Mark is a fantastic person, and I've found that these folks are really experts in many fields and entertain us with good facts. So Mark, thanks for entertaining us with good facts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a good one. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. From cozy breakfast nooks to formal dining areas, Ashley has versatile dining options starting at just $499.99. And for a limited time only, you can receive a $250 mattress credit with the purchase of any six-piece bedroom set. Plus, get 60 months special financing on select in-store purchases made with your Ashley Advantage Synchrony credit card. Shop and save today, only at Ashley. Subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. No minimum purchase required. See Ashley.com for details. Chance you'll see. You like slots, we got lots. Blackjack roulette, take your shots. Where you want to be. Bet Rivers Online Casino is your home for chance. With hundreds of slots, live table games, and more. Bet Rivers Online Casino. Check out the app. Take a chance. Must be 21 plus and physically present in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Void were prohibited. Terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler.